Good morning. I'm Luke. I'm in software. I've been in software since 2016 and uh, joining uh, today with Lacey to talk about um, just getting into software and kind of some different viewpoints there. But Lacey, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Lacey Cherry. I am in Kansas City and I've been doing tech recruiting for a little bit over nine years, both internal and agency. Um, and just recently, partly in part to uh, Luke's contributions, have become more interested in helping uh, entry level grads get their first position. There you go. Um, so kind of the the reason we're we're chatting about this is I did a LinkedIn post the other day, a couple of days ago about um, like how how I see getting into software is like a, a long game and really like the, the market's been tough. Um, and so if you just keep on doing what you're doing and keep on trying, you'll eventually get into software. And I think that that's watered down and there's a lot of like different things that I believe about how you should get into software underneath that. But as like uh, the most basic rule of getting into software, that's how I see it, right? And so just maybe taking one step back, like it's tough to get into software right now. Like the way I see the market for getting your first job in software is that um, back in 2022, starting in the summer, um, you know, big tech started doing a bunch of layoffs and things started to get tighter. And, it, and it, as an industry as a whole, it has been more difficult since the summer of 2022 to get your first job in software than you know, the previous several years. Um, and so I think it's remained that way since then. Um, people are still getting jobs in software, but it, you know, it's in trickles instead of um, en masse. And it's it's just hard. And so there are a lot of people who have graduated coding boot camps or have taught themselves how to code um, and who have been looking for their first software job for months and months, some year plus, right? And I don't think that that's a unique situation right now. And so that that's kind of the background for the conversation. But yeah, my original post was, hey, you just keep on trying and consistency over time will get you into software. And then Lacey, with your viewpoint. Yeah, I, and, and I think, yes, you do keep going. But I think my comment was doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And in this market, shaking things up a little bit. And I know a lot of bootcamp grads that are following the rules to find a job. And I'm not saying that you don't follow the rules, but I'm saying how you're following them can impact your reach and your ability to get in front of the right people. And that's that's where my point was it's, it's a little bit about the pattern interrupt, a little bit about doing the right things, but how are you doing them? Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe part of the reason I didn't expound is that there's so many things, but that, you know, we can expound on them here. But if for a LinkedIn post, like just going into right. all that detail just doesn't make sense. I, I don't think um, <laughs> you're not a room. Um but yeah, I think like one thing that keeps me from telling people just do this different thing is that when you're trying to get into software, there's so much noise, right? There's like people saying, right. just do this and people just saying, just do this. And like, um, I, I, there, I think is like a set of things that you do need to be doing to get into software. But then when people hit you all the time with try this and try this and, you know, try to learn this new stack. And then you'll, you know, be more um, competitive as opposed to your peers because you've got this new stack and like it, it can be overwhelming and it can lead to people like going in too many directions and not doing anything. Right. Because they're just constantly changing directions. Um. Yeah, so to to that point, what what's your response to that? So I think from a technical perspective, which is where you were coming from in your in your original post, um, I I think you stick with what you know. You become a master of something, not someone that knows a little bit about everything. And a lot of clients are not they're not tech specific. A lot of large clients are tech agnostic. They might be coding in Ruby, but if you code in C-sharp, they want to hear how you code in C-sharp. 
And so I think staying focused technically, I think that's important as not to get pulled in a million different directions with every new idea or technology that comes out. When I'm saying try something different, when you reach out to people, use a different message. Your LinkedIn profile, change it up so it reflects who you are, not just what you can do. Your resume is probably very, very factual. Weave your story into the resume. And I say that because people hire who they like and they hire people that are like them. And if you can weave a little bit about your personality into a resume, you may get that interview. Whereas if you're just regurgitating facts in a tech stack that you've used, you don't look any different than anyone else applying. And when I say anybody else, you and I both know it's thousands of people applying to one job. So that's where I'm saying, try something different. Not, I mean, everybody needs a resume. I'm just saying, look at how you do your resume. Everyone has a LinkedIn profile. How did you put it together? What does it say? What is the content? And how does that speak to people? So from a tech perspective, stay in your lane, keep getting better, keep working, keep working on project work, keep collaborating with other developers. But when it comes to your presentation of self, that's where I'm saying to mix it up a little bit. Okay. But, and so like when it comes to like the job hunt process and like your um, point about the definition of insanity and doing the same thing over and over and over, um, like, so what you're saying is, um, you know, differenti differentiate yourself a little bit, right? And humanize mm -hmm. yourself and use some yep. tactics that, um, yep. you know, uh, will help you to stand out and make a connection with, you know, the, the places you're trying to get hired at, right? Um, yes. And I, I guess, you know, what, what comes to my mind is, well, let's say that doesn't work, right? I, or... <laughs> I guess, how much do you change when it doesn't work? You know, because it's not going to work the first time, right? So you have changed your resume and you you weave in your story and you, um, you know, do your LinkedIn profile a certain way that makes it, you know, uh, more robust than other people um, and more interesting. But then, you know, one week goes by and you don't get a job. Well, then what do you do week two? Like, do you change it again? Or, um, yeah, I, I guess that's my question. I would ask how long you've been doing it the way you've been doing it. Have you really been doing it the same way for 12 months and you're going to bail on a new idea after a week? I think, I don't think that makes any sense, especially in this market when we know things are dragging along, especially at the end of the year when most people are just waiting for their budgets to re-up until January. So like the next month and a half are kind of like dead space, you know, um, so I would say I would I would sit with it. I would I would continue to tweak it. And you know, I mess with my LinkedIn profile all the time. Like I make just little random changes all the time just to make it a little bit different. And and I think there's a certain amount of fear in in mixing things up. You're fearful that you've said too much. You've said it in a way that somebody didn't like it. You you posted something that someone didn't like, and that that is going to keep you from getting a job. My message to that is if you being authentically you in a professional way on a profile on a linkedin on a on a resume in a post that you make that keeps you from getting a job you probably don't want to work for those people anyway yeah fair enough and and so <laughs> you are kind of condoning doing the same thing over and over just doing a different thing over and over I, I'm not condoning cold applying over and over. I'm I'm never going to condone that. That is detrimental to your mental health. And that, look at what's happened, okay? People are opening jobs. They have no recruiting staff. The recruiting staffs of these companies in this country have been decimated over the last 18 months. So they have posted jobs that are getting 900 applications and four and a half hours. And they literally have no one to read them. So people are saying, well, I never hear anything back. Well, that's because there's no one there to read them. There's no one there to go through those applications. You know, I, I came I came from a company that had 13 recruiters and they have one now. They had a need for 13 recruiters and now they have one. So people applying aren't getting the same timing and aren't getting that same feedback. I'm, I'm a big believer in finding internal referrals in companies that you're interested in. I'm a big believer in in doing your own spider webbing on LinkedIn to find out who works where and who you know that knows somebody that works somebody where. 
And so I would do that type of approach over and over. I would, I'm, I'm not ever going to be on board with cold applying in this market. I just think it's, I think it's rough and I think it's hard on people. Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of interesting tangent. Um, so, uh, well, earlier this year, I think like in July, 2023, I, um, interviewed 10 people who got their first job in software. And I, I kind of was on the same boat as you, like, Hey, cold applying is soul crushing, right? It like, yeah. you know, do it for months and months and all you get is negative feedback or no feedback. And, um, you know, it's such a small chance that your resume will get looked at because hundreds of applications in, you know, hours, like you've said, um, but when I interviewed those 10 people, like I want to say like six or seven had gotten the opportunity that resulted in a job from cold applying. So I, I think there is some value to it, but right. I, I, I think that <laughs> if it's all you're doing, then that's, that's, uh, do you know of those people that number surprises me for one? So I, I mean, I, I would concede that that has happened, but do you know of those people, how long they had been unemployed, how long they had been applying before getting those jobs? Months, months. Okay. Yeah. yeah all of the months. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think probably most of them had jobs, you know, so they weren't just like unemployed. They, they were working mm -hmm. with just not in software. Um, and yeah, I, I was surprised at that as well. And they, I was surprised by the numbers too of how many applications because I asked that question in all the interviews like how many cold applications did you do like some were as low as like 60 I would say is like the lowest and then like the highest was like 250 something like that so I, I would have thought you know hundreds and hundreds like 500 plus for yeah. each one. but you know I, and you know maybe just by the luck of the dry interviewed the six people in 2023 who that worked out for but uh yeah, I, I was surprised as well. Um, and networking has typically been like what I tell people they should do to try to find a job in software. So you you mentioned in, um, you know, our conversation earlier, and then also on your comment on that post, um, people who are doing the right things, right, to get into software. What What do you see like the classic right things as? I think, I think the perceived right things <laughs> are searching jobs, saving jobs, applying to jobs, tweaking your resume to fit each job that you apply to, um, tailoring your LinkedIn profile to match your resume, um, working on the side to continue to keep skills sharp, to prepare for technical interviews. Um, those types of things I think are, are what people believe are, are the right things to do. And, and I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just saying like, what weight do you put on each thing? I, I certainly would think about any type of in-person meetups where you can in-person network with people. Um, I learned a long time ago, it's a lot harder to say no to somebody's face than it is to a message. Um, so, you know, trying to kind of find find your group, find your area, um, obviously networking online with LinkedIn, I, I think is a huge, I think you should put huge emphasis on that. Um, also, you know, looking at if, if these, if these are folks that came out of boot camps, looking at where other folks that graduated from that boot camp before you, where did they go work? Because that tells you that place will hire someone like you. Mm -hmm. And then those people you have a connection to, whether you, that whether they completed their boot camp three years before you did or not, there's a connection there. Use that type of connection. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's where I would put the weight. Yes, there are some positions you should apply for. I have cold applied to some positions since I was laid off. N none of that went well. Let's be very honest. But there's sometimes you see a job and you're like, oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. I'm not saying don't ever apply to something that looks appealing. But once you apply, find the person in talent acquisition, find the hiring manager, find the HR person, send them a message. You know, if you find three, send all three a message and ask, are you responsible for this job? I just applied and I'd like your feedback. So that second step, that's that's where I think that there is some value in cold applying if you follow that up with another touch point. Mm -hmm or two, or three, or however many you can find. Right. Yeah, I, I get maybe it's worth, um, you know, saying like, as I see it, the uh, things that you should be doing to get into software, um, cold applying at some level, like not not a whole lot, but you know, just a couple to it. 
I see it as like creating the possibility for opportunity, right? Like if, right. if the chances of it working out and getting you an interview at all, let alone a job offer are very, very slim, right? But at least you're you're buying the lottery ticket, right? You can't win the lottery, yep. you don't buy the ticket. Um, so that that uh, LinkedIn, you know, networking with people, posting on LinkedIn. Uh, so being very active there, optimizing your LinkedIn profile as like a, a sales funnel. So people who splash onto your page or top of the funnel and you got to convince them to scroll down. So your profile picture, tagline, uh, cover photo need to be real strong to make that sale. Um, mm -hmm. And then having a resume on there, featured section, project section, um, you know, those things. Uh, networking through just like coffee, chats, if you can get people to get on a Zoom for 15 minutes, um, going to hackathons, software meetups. And then building software projects. So that that's the advice I give on like, these are the right things you should be doing. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's just tough to tell people like branch out, do something different, like to without like, well, how do I do that? You know? It, yeah, so I've, I've been on calls lately with with senior level people that are sharing their resume with me and you know they've been affected by layoffs they're looking for a job and I'm looking at their resume and I'm like okay this is nice but who are you tell me more tell me more about like how you impacted these things that you're talking about give me a little bit of your story in here somewhere so it's not it's not just this is affecting people that have not gotten into software I think it's affecting a lot of people and I think I think it it goes back to this thing about most people right now most companies right now don't have the recruiting or the TA teams in place to handle the amount of volume that you're getting so everything that you do has to be you know 7 seconds to capture someone's attention on a resume what are you doing on LinkedIn to capture someone's attention and and my way of capturing attention may be different than yours it, you have to find your voice, but I'm encouraging people to kind of let go of the fear of rubbing somebody the wrong way or coming off a certain way. If you're speaking your truth and you're speaking it in a professional way, stick with that. Cause I think that that's powerful. Um, and I, and I practice what I preach. I mean, you can look at my LinkedIn profile. It is not what you would call normal. I think I say I eat grit for breakfast. Um, but it's my voice, it's my truth, and it's my version of me. And I think the more people can really just come into a place where I'm going to put the best version of myself forward in my truest form, and people can take it or leave it. And I know that's a really hard thing to say right now with so many people out of work. That This isn't going to last forever. And when it turns back around, you're going to want people to, the right people to gravitate towards you, the people that you want to work for, that would be a good opportunity for you. Um, and I, I, I truly believe that's, that's one of the best ways to do it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think the, um, the insight that like, Hey, it's going to be dead space from now through, you know, the end of the year is helpful for someone to, you know, hear because, you know, that that's a month and a half of like, well, mm -hmm. you know, discouragement if you don't realize that, you know, budgets are all used up. People don't really hire at the end of the year. Um, right. And then, you know, there will be hiring in Q1. But then also, I've, I've always thought that uh, software hiring for some reason is kind of seasonal. I don't know if you would agree with that. I think um, the majority of the jobs I've gotten in software have been in the summer. Like, I feel like that's when... And maybe it's not just software. Maybe that's all business. But is that a thing? A, a lot of times when, when companies get their budget, it depends on the size of the company, right? Smaller companies can move quicker. They can hire earlier. The larger companies, they go through more of a process. So if they're waiting for budgets to be, be re-upped, they get that money in January. Then hopefully they're doing some headcount planning now. But if they're not, they start looking at their org and where they're going to open new headcount and al allocate for new roles to be to be filled. Then they start working on job descriptions. Then they start getting finance approval. Uh, and then they start launching those, you know, and I, my guess, they're going to start launching those roles February, March of 2024. Um, and that's for your more corporate companies that have more red tape to get through, you know, your, your small, you know, one location company 
they may be able to move quicker. They may already have their headcount figured out. Um, that that's my best guess. And and I I I guess I want to be clear because there's two groups of clients right now. There are some clients that are trying to spend their money before the end of the year or it will go away. They're the few. That's the few group. And then the majority, like you said, are waiting for their budgets to re-up. There are still some people scrambling to spend money before the end of the year because they will lose that budget. These aren't government jobs. These are like, <laughs> these are private sector. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's the whole use it or lose it mentality. Uh, there was one year in my agency experience where my biggest month of the year was in November. Hmm. And I was not expecting it. It was the biggest month I'd had in nine years. And it happened in November. I think it just varies by industry, varies by company. A lot of times summer, I see a slowdown in certain cases because people, their their kids are out of school. They're going on family vacations. We have hiring managers out. We've got interviewers out and it slows the process a little bit. Um, but I would definitely slant it towards first half of the year, hiring heavy, second half of the year, it slows down like gradually till we get to the end. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've told people, <laughs> that hiring in software is cyclical or follows the, you know the uh the school year and they do more hiring in summer so maybe i should stop saying that i haven't said i anything. mean it, like, it really <laughs> depends it really does but i mean i i've had situations where I'm like are they taking a three-way vacation where are these people going can we come back and interview the candidates now you know and it you know spring break things slow down during spring break because people are taking off some time with their families um you know and it 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 really it depends but when we're in a very candidate driven market it doesn't matter what time of year it is they're going to do what it takes to hire people and that's what we saw in 21 and 22 half of 22 you mm -hmm. know it didn't matter what time of what you, what month we were in they were going to hire mm -hmm. let me jump back to the uh what what you do to um stand out, like differentiate yourself, do something different out of the box. Um, so let me, I'm just going to repeat what I think your advice is on that and like how you go about it. And then you tell me where I'm wrong. So um, there's the LinkedIn profile. There's the uh, posting on LinkedIn and conversations you have, uh, how you talk, and then the resume. And so I think that those are the three areas that you said, like, you know, that's where you have opportunity to differentiate yourself, let people see that you're human with the, you know, um, so on the LinkedIn profile, it'd be like the about section where you describe yourself, maybe the profile picture, the tagline, the cover photo, those are like opportunities for you to um, like humanize yourself, right? Tell your story and have like a, a voice. Uh, instead of just regurgitate facts. And then maybe in like the job history, like in the content of where you're describing what you did at that job, like instead of just like, a, a here's the job description that I, you know, applied to. And so then I was copy paste that here, like saying like, these were the things I did and the impact it had. Um, and then, so same thing in the resume when, when you're detailing um, like, past work history saying something other than just regurgitating facts. Um, and then when you post on LinkedIn, you know, making it engaging and personal and um, yeah, less fact-based, more uh, here's my worldview kind of thing. Yep. I, yeah. I, I agree with all of that. Um, th these are the opportunities where you have, if you can, get someone to stop and read your entire profile, read your entire resume, you could get somewhere, right? But the things that we're talking about, that about me section, your profile picture, your background, that's how you're going to capture the attention to get them to actually read the content that you want them to read. Like, I don't really care what anybody thinks about my profile picture, but if it makes them look and be like, is she holding her dog? Yes, I am. And then get to my about me section and they may think I'm, partially unhinged by the time they get there but maybe they're interested in it and maybe they keep reading you know and so that's what that's what you want you want them to view the whole thing and 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 how you capture that attention is unique to each person and I can't tell anyone how I can tell people how I pattern interrupt I can't tell 
you had a pattern interrupt for yourself because everybody has their own communication style. They have their own set of strengths and they have their own comfort level with kind of sliding outside the box a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, and so you're working for yourself these days. Mm -hmm. Do you consult with people? I do. Yeah. I do resume calls. I do profile calls. Um, I do interview prep calls. I do negotiation calls. <laughs> Um, helping people negotiate in a market where everyone is getting lowballed has been a lot of fun. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I, I am, I am here to help people navigate this. I am not, this is not something that I wouldn't tell that I wouldn't tell my brother, you know, no. I mean, he, he had to hear it for months. Right. <laughs> um, and it's not something that I don't do myself. And I, I, it's practice what you preach kind of thing. Um, but I just, I, I, and this isn't going to be as necessary when the market picks back up. But for now, if you want to feel like you have a chance to make an impact for yourself and advocate for yourself with these applications and with these networking events, this is what I believe you should do. And so on the, uh, yes, you do do calls and consult on that stuff. Um, like where, what's the uh, way to sign up to do that with you? Just reach out to me on LinkedIn and let me know a little bit about your situation. And if I think I can help, I will let you know. And if it's not something that I think I can help with, I'll let you know that too. And where does um, the, what do you charge? <laughs> That's a work in progress. Um, there's been a lot of content right now about career coaches, like exploiting people's situations. I don't want to be that person. Um, I have never started a call saying I'm going to charge you X, Y, Z. I've talked to people if, uh, it works out and somebody wants to pay me a fee for helping them with the resume, we kind of talk about that separately. If it's a short conversation, it takes 15 minutes for me to get somebody kind of like on the right track. I'm not going to charge them for that. I don't want to be lumped in with that exploitation group because I, <laughs> I've seen it. I've yeah. had somebody call me and say, uh, this person wants $700 to review my resume. This person has been unemployed for months. I looked at the resume. It's not $700 worth of broken. Okay. And I was like, do not do that. I will, I will get, we will get it right. You know, and, and I, I do not want to fall in that crowd. I really want to be in a situation where if I can help people, I will, if it works out for me financially, great. Not everything I'm doing right now is for money. Um, it is more of a altruistic pay it forward to a community that has paid me over the years. That's where I'm at. Um, so you've had a lot of these conversations. Um, can you give me an example? And this is tough. <laughs> so just tell me, no, if uh, it, it's not coming to you right away, but can you give me an example of somebody came to you with like, you know, cookie cutter, um, you know, nothing but facts kind of resume slash, LinkedIn profile slash approach to job hunting and what it looked like after you helped them. Yes. Um, I did that recently um, with a person that I had placed four or five years ago. They came to me saying they're, they're looking for a change, looking for more like higher level executive type roles. I know this person. I've known them well. I know how they talk. I know who they are. I know like kind of a little bit about them. And I looked at their resume and I was like, we're really buttoned up here, aren't we? We're really, really playing it safe. And we literally went through the resume line by line. And I was like, okay, I'm reading this. That's facts. Did you have anything to do with it? Or are you just stating facts? Tell me what you did. Tell me how you impacted. Tell me how you mentored. Tell me about the team you mentored. And I like to call it swaggy fresh. We add a little swag in parts of the resume that is not it's not cocky, it's confidence and it's assuredness in the skill set. And so we literally went through the resume line by line um, and we got it to a place where he felt like it reflected him more um, and it it was more in his voice yet maintained a professional enough approach to be uh, um, considered for executive type roles. And it took us, I don't know, it took us an hour and 15 minutes to go through it like line by line. And he's like editing, we're sharing a screen. He's editing while I'm talking. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, 
it's it's not a long process if you've got something to work with. To create a resume from scratch, that's going to take me a little bit more time because I don't know what your past experiences have been. But if we've got something to work with and, and making those changes, I, I did it with someone else the other day. And I thought it was really interesting because the person told me she wanted to leave her job because she felt like her company was putting her in a box. And then I read her profile and I read her LinkedIn, you know, her resume. And I thought she was putting herself in a box mm -hmm. by what she's saying and how it closed up and how guarded it was. And I was like, well, what do you expect that they want you to do? Because that's what you, how you play it. Like you want to put out in your resume, what you want to come back to you, the type of job that you want to, want to come back to you. Mm -hmm. So that, those are a couple of examples. Um, what I'm seeing most is people initially being fearful that it's not going to be well received. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's still over 250,000 software jobs in this com 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 country. So if somebody doesn't like what you say, they're probably not your pe people. Find the people that like what you say. Find the people that appreciate your truth. Hmm. I, was, I forgot I was going to ask you about that. Where are you getting that number from? Uh, maybe Gartner. Um, one at, one tech crunch. One of the articles online, oh, like okay. one of the kind of like reporting job tech software reporting jobs. I can't remember who it was. I did a post on my dream jobs facilitator post about the state of like IT in 2024. It, it was indicating the same thing. Okay. Um, I went to an engineering school. I should probably get used to citing my uh, <laughs> citing my facts. I oh, didn't I do that. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess where my mind was with uh, one, I just thought interesting. Like, how did you get that information? But then two, like, how would people go about like um, finding out? like how many of those jobs are the junior jobs like you, you mentioned in your um in your comment but yeah that's that's the thing i i'm acknowledging that those are not all junior jobs 100 mm percent. -hmm. i do think though that with what's happening in the market there's actually a little bit more opportunity in the junior entry-level space because of how cost conscious folks are mm -hmm. um and when when we when companies are doing these layoffs they're eliminating headcount <laughs> but they can still hire an entry level contractor and that does not go back to their headcount that doesn't impact that and it's it's a a low cost low risk situation for them because it's a contract it's low money and it gets someone in the door um and then you and I both know the need is still there these companies are laying so many folks off yet the deadlines are still being met, met or they're supposed to be and the product is still being made so i do think there is a little window um, to higher entry level talent, uh, like, like Corey's situation, he, you know, he was absolutely entry level, signed a contract. Um, it did not impact headcount for the client it and, and, and he's getting great experience. So I, I think a lot of times people assume their first job is going to be direct hire full time. If it's contract or contract for hire in this market, I would absolutely take it. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. I tell people if they're going to pay you to code, you should, you should take it. <laughs> yep. That's especially first job. That's how I see it. And, and sometimes I, I think you would agree with me. Yes, they're paying you to code, but they're they're also paying you to learn. You're getting right. to learn. Right. I mean, some of the stuff that that that, that Corey's been touching, I'm thrilled with. Mm -hmm. He had no experience in it and he's getting paid to do it. And I'm like, this is a win. This is a total right. win. No, everything I hear from people who get into software is like I spent, you know, months and months and months learning to code and then I got my first job and I learned at like three times that rate. Right. So like in the first month of actually being paid to code, I learned as much as I did in my boot camp, um, you know, which was three times as long. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Getting paid to learn for sure. Well, Lacey, any closing thoughts, you think? Um, I, I, I one, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for going back and forth with me. And I, I know that, you know, I'm on like one camp and you're in one camp, but I think that our, our mission has some overlap. Mm -hmm. um, and that is to help people get to work, um, help people find their first job. So I appreciate you for um, your impacts. And if, if there's things on my side of things that are not technical things, more about presenting yourself, interview prep, um, salary negotiation. I love salary negotiation. That's like a lot of fun. Um I'm 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 here to help. I'm here to be a resource. Um, I'm I'm all over the place on LinkedIn. Follow my company page, Dream Jobs Facilitated, and 
I, I, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Awesome. 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 And just for the record, I don't disagree with anything you've said. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I see it a little differently. So I, I don't think we're like in two polar opposite groups. I just, well, I just can't code and you can. That's what puts me in my camp. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, hey, Lacey, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next conversation. All right. Same here. Have a have a wonderful Thanksgiving and we'll talk soon. All right. Bye bye.